My business was running and ticking along. I was traveling around the world, having fun. I was living my best life. And I realized I couldn't remember the last time I thought about taking my own life. It's like even like with the depression, people think that the depression went away. It didn't. It's just I've resourced myself to be able to deal with it. And it was the uncovering of that which sits underneath everything that I share and teach with people. Gladiators, welcome back. Today I have a very special guest, uh, Daniel Mangana. Yep, beautifully pronounced. <laughs> uh, he's an absolute... Uh, why well, can I say he's the he's a shining star. He's a dreamer. He's a motivator. He's an inspirational speaker, an inspirational character. His energy is unbelievable. I didn't know him, but our paths crossed in the gym, and I could feel the amazing vibration. So, thank you very much for coming. Thanks for having me. Really happy welcome to be here. Welcome yeah. to the arena. Yeah, Daniel, tell me all about you. Oh, all about me. So, uh, if you meet, no, do me an elevator pitch. We met meet in a lift. Yeah. Oh, what do you do? I am very passionate about empowering people to consciously choose the life that they live and that that life that they live is an abundant, joyful and purpose driven one. That's what I do. Love it. When you say abundant, because I'm yeah. about abundance, mm -hmm. okay? Tell me the challenges that most people have when it comes to abundance, because I have my own feelings and thoughts about that. Yeah. I think the thing that jumps out at me is when I say abundant, people automatically go to think about money. And over the last few years, that's kind of what I've gotten to be known about. But money is just one aspect of abundance. Abundance for me is all of your needs being met physically, mentally, and emotionally so that you're in a position to be a contribution to others without needing to think about yourself. And that's your energy, your time, your resources, your your vitality. So I think one of the main challenges that people have in that is that they don't actually have a reality that matches that. For me, there's a difference between the reality and the truth of the situation because the truth is that everything's here. But our reality, our everyday situation doesn't always match that. And so people are running around um, focused on paying the bills in scarcity, fear. People are running around trying to make 40 hours a week stretch, right, to, to, to the job, to the business, to the kids, to the self. And so the reality isn't matching the truth that everything's here. And I, I guess a big part of my job is helping people to reconnect to that truth so the reality actually matches. What is the truth? The truth is that everything's here. Abundance is our natural state. When people ask me about abundance, I would say, let's go to nature. When you go into nature, do you ever see any lack anywhere? You don't. It's always abundant. Even if um, we were to all disappear and there were cracks in the ground, nature would grow and, and take it over. The only time that abundance starts to stop being so apparent in nature is when humans get involved. Yeah, when we have power of choice. Power right? of choice. So humans get involved. So the natural order of things is abundance, needs being met. Um, you can go to any scripture and it's always going to say say the same thing. Look at the flowers of the field, they, to they toil not, and yet look, is anything more uh, beautifully adorned than it? The natural order of things is to thrive, it's to be in abundance. But we as humans have realities that don't match that truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh my God, we're going to open the Pandora's box. <laughs> okay. Uh, one thing I, I, I talk about is that you said nature gives you what you need. Mm -hmm. Okay. We are the generation. Are we going to go back? What qualifies you to teach? And yeah, we're going to go do all that. Mm -hmm. This is really fascinating for me. Um, nature gives you what you need, mm -hmm. but humans are driven by what they want. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so somebody would come and say, "Well, I've got what I need, but I want this, I want that, I want that, I want this." Mm -hmm. Okay, do you say, "Hang on a second, calm down. You got what you need. Be happy." Or do you say, "Go for what you want," and this is what's stopping you from? This is the this yeah. is where I play. Okay, right? I'm I with just you. want to hear your approach. So I have a I definition. Be the coach. <laughs> <laughs> I'm. I have a definition of desire. Mm -hmm. And I define desire as the heart speaking to you what the universe, divine, God or source wants to speak through you. There are some people who are from paranoia, from ego, from greed, from a place of lack, chasing after things. And that's what they want beyond their need. Mm -hmm. But for me, desire, a burning thing within us to go for something that goes beyond our needs is divinely led and divinely given and so it's a part of your need because it's a part of what you're here to do and experience so i actually love to get us into a space where we can start to differentiate between what we're chasing after from a place of lack and what we're moving towards from a divine purpose perspective 
which may go beyond what we need, right? I got to hang out, obviously, you know, introduced to the guys we're going to be on NECA next year. But like, even when I hang out with like people are playing at that level, like billionaires, the people who are happy in that space of having unimaginable wealth are the ones aren't doing it because they're chasing the numbers. They're doing it because there's a desire within them that's been expressed through the medium of them having those numbers. So with Sir Richard, for example, he really takes care of his people, the people that he's here to serve through um, through his businesses and the people that get to work for him. So when I sit with him and have conversations with him, not at any point is it about how much money that he's making. It's bringing this idea to life. Going to space isn't because he's an ego e egotistical person that wants to go to space. He dreamed as a little boy of going to space and humanity gets to be pushed forward by virtue of that. And of course, because he's doing it entrepreneurially, he'll be re uh, remunerated and rewarded financially for that. Although he hasn't been. One of his businesses went bankrupt recently. Yeah. One um, of his space projects yeah, went bankrupt. I, got, I had to speak to him about that. I got to speak to him about that when I was with him the other day. You know, he had said, you know, that's... Well, when did you meet him last? Uh, was it, I was on the island in March. What were you doing there? I got to hang out there for a week. Oh, is this the? Oh, because the next one's in March. So, so next, every month. I go every year. This is wow. this was my second trip. Next year is going to be my third. Oh, trip. Wow. So you spoke to him about the potential failure of a business. Well, not so much failure because he, he. I've never seen him use the word failure. Exactly. That's he used the challenges, saying. and he did say, you know, there's some stuff that kind of spilled over from from COVID, mm -hmm. and then we're moving things around, and not everything was really going to make it. But you know, I think sometimes people lose sight of the fact that when you come into the arena of entrepreneurship and of business. There may be a lion, mm -hmm. there may be someone else, another gladiator in there with a sword that's trying to take you out, mm -hmm. but that's the game of business. And so we take those risks of maybe not getting to the end goal that we wanted, but we learn what we can from that fight mm -hmm. and live to fight another day. And you see, that's the energy it gives out. 100%. Although he nearly went, he nearly took him down. I mean, if, even if you read his book, um, Losing My Virginity, which is the first one, mm -hmm. And you read the whole story of his journey, yes. right? This is one of the reasons why I was so, so grateful that I got to meet that goal of, of me because I've got other wealthy people that I've gotten to know or whatever, but born and raised in the UK, there were only really two entrepreneurs that were self-made. Let me think, let me think, let me think. Yeah. Richard Branson yeah. and uh, The Apprentice. Uh, no, no. And Anita Roddick. Oh, Anita Roddick. Really? Yeah, yeah. Because... Part. So back in the day, I'm talking about when I was, I mean, so it, so, um, Lord uh, Lord Sugar came up after, right? When it was already, it was already kind of fun to be an entrepreneur by then because you had the apprentice show. But I'm talking about 20, 30 years ago, you didn't have people mm. on the rich list who weren't gentrified or whatever. You whatever. Meet her, no, no, I didn't get a chance to meet her. Yes, yeah, she did. She did. She did. But in terms of having people that I could look up to, it was really powerful. So reading the book and then getting to meet the person who is in the book and find them to be the same person, it was never really an easy road. It was always, always hard. If you look at the battle between Virgin and British Airways, when you look at everything that happened with him having to battled all along from the beginning. He was beginning. in courts and constantly always. Yeah. And he shared a story last year about um, the British Telecom, Virgin uh, Mobile, not British Telecom. Um, not T-Mobile. Uh, T-Mobile, yeah, T-Mobile, yeah. And shared about that story. and Because he was running in the back of T-Mobile Network, wasn't yep. he? he was and then they tried to screw him over. Did they? Yeah, they tried to screw him over and it went to court and he ended up winning. But when you look at the demeanor mm -hmm. and the energy with which he moved through these challenges, it's really, really inspiring. Doesn't let it get him down or anything. No, not that I've seen. Because I often wonder, I'm thinking, he must be at a stage I think, do I need it? But he doesn't do it because he needs it. He does it because he's passionate about it. And he's always finding something to be passionate about. Yeah. That's my experience of it. Mm -hmm. Tell me about you. <laughs> what qualify, are you, what do you do now? Do you coach people? You have I do a little bit of coaching. Much? We've got some programs, but that's not really, really, really my fault. The funny thing was, I didn't come into this field to make money. I walked away from my consulting business because I actually wanted to come and make a difference. I had what, quite... you, what was your consulting business? So I was doing project funding and project management primarily. Um, a company's called Corner 4 Consulting. We're still London. kind of... Um, no, we're... I was running out of the UK till about 2018. I left the UK in 2018. Okay. So I've kind of been nomading it since then, primarily based um, out of a, uh, an LLC in the US at the moment. But um, yeah. I stopped primarily doing the consulting in 2018 through Corner 4 because I was like, 
I had to, right. I had made and lost two multi-million pound fortunes by the age of 23. So I made and lost it twice. Second time took me out very, very hard. I was in deep suicidal ideation, like really, really, really bad place. I came out of that place accidentally. And people are like, what do you mean you came out of it accidentally? I didn't set about to clean up and get happy and positive again. I actually got into such a dark place that the only reason why I didn't make an attempt, D, was because I thought that I was so much of a loser, I'm going to fail. So I didn't make a suicide attempt because I didn't want to fail at that on top of everything. Yeah, walk around with one eye, one leg or something. Whatever yeah, the thing exactly. was, right? Uh, like the idea of cut marks on the thing or someone having to cut me down if, like, it just didn't something really work. wrong and <laughs> So that's really down, isn't yeah, it? I was really, really bad. Like the only, I in think your early twenties. This was when I was twenty three, twenty four. So I, I'm so grateful that I was in the UK and didn't have access to a firearm because if I had access to a firearm, I would have done it because that was the only thing I could think of as being I, I can't mess that up. That's the only thing well, that's going to. It be. has been known that people have messed that up as well. You know that. that yeah, I know that. I know that now, which is kind of gallows humor about the whole situation. <laughs> So what actually happened was I had this idea in my mind that if I can work out why I had been successful up to a point so many times mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. failed, mm -hmm. I can understand how not to fail at suicide. And that was the really backwards logic. I mean, I've been reading books like Think and Grow Rich since 16 years old. I read Psycho Cybernetics as a teenager, Joe Carbo's Easy Way to Riches, um, Charles F. Harnell's Master Key System. I was studying those books as a teenager. And that's what led to my early success. But one of the things I think that people lose sight of is that information without experience, whether yours or a mentor or a coach or someone who can do there's no wisdom and without wisdom you're never going to get to the end goal and so i had some of the formula but throwing the arrogance of youth and the fact that you know i was it a little number of, easily it, did, it, it didn't it wasn't that it came easily it's that it came without sufficient resistance for me to understand that i don't know everything right the challenges that came were surmountable for me um and so fast track now to few years later when i'm looking at everything going wrong completely i'm like well it worked up to a point so if i can work out what i got wrong or what is wrong or what's bs about it i can pull off my suicide and i threw myself back into that material suicide is such a negative thing isn't it it is such a negative but thing that was your driving force that was my driving force and so i learned to transliterate arabic and hebrew i was reading ancient texts studying people's life stories because i had to understand what was wrong um, books like The Power of Now became popular at the time. The Secret came out around the time. And I was dissecting these things to say, well, that's poppycock. That's poppycock. That's real. That's poppycock. And eventually got to the point where I didn't realize it, but I woke up in March of 2015. I just came back from a trip with my cousin. We had a boys trip to, to Thailand. My business was running and ticking along. I'd done two weeks away and only taken this one 10 minute consulting business. This is my consulting business. I'd only taken one 10 minute phone call and yet the business was doing an average of about hundred thousand pounds a month. And I woke up that morning and I scratched my head. I was in a beautiful home in Highgate, North London. I was traveling around the world, having fun. I was living my best life. And I realized I couldn't remember the last time I thought about taking my own life. And that's when until it, you woke up next to a lady boy. <laughs> so this is this is too much. Unless unless that's what you're into. Mm -hmm. And so I basically spun around and realized, oh my goodness, somehow something yeah. changed. Yeah. And I I didn't I to this day I can't tell you what there wasn't some light bulb moment or what I oh, I don't know what happened. And it was the uncovering of that that became the formulation of what I've called my beyond intention paradigm, which sits underneath everything that I share and teach with people. And when I spun around in March 2018 and committed to sharing this with the world, it was to share it with the world. I was committed to being a poor teacher running around on my own dime. I wasn't intending to have financial success on the back of it. It just happened that that unfolded over time also. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. We're going to come to that. Now, let's yeah. go back a bit. Back. Tell me about your upbringing. Yeah. Uh, where, mm -hmm. family, yep. entrepreneurs, personal development, such a young age. What, what got you into that? Just. So my mum and dad immigrated from Zimbabwe in the 70s. So they were education migrants. They weren't economic migrants. Um, I am the third of five of my mum's kids. Um, I was a happy accident. I know that to be the case because there's eight years between me and my sister. My dad had got away from, for like six months. 
and when he got back nine months later, I was born. So it kind of worked out. I was a welcome home gift. Uh, Then I had a a sister that was born uh, 18 months later, and then I've got a baby sister as well. Um, Very, very education. You said your mum, so you have more siblings. Yeah, my dad's got kids as well. Yeah, my dad's got kids as well from before. So um, I didn't find out until I was 27 years old that I was diagnosed with Asperger's. Right, so I'm on the autistic spectrum. I didn't know that that's why my brain was wired to function a certain way. And so my consumption of information and my following threads on stuff, it's just the way that my brain is wired. So little things like I taught myself to make computers when I was 13 years old, like I was on the entrepreneurship tip from very, very young. But I don't think it's because I was naturally... Um, yeah, you were naturally. It was, it was the way he was wired. It's to the way I was wired, right? So Did when you I think he was stupid or do you think he was genius? Oh, always genius, always genius. Really? Well, yeah, yeah, because um, I always did exceptionally well in particular subjects at school. Uh, and those that I didn't do as well at, I was still enough high in the percentile. Had your IQ? Tested? Yeah, I've never had my IQ tested. So I don't think I've got an IQ per se. I have a problem solving strategic brain as a result, a result of the way that it's wired. So I wouldn't say that I'm necessarily like a, a like a Mensa person or whatever like that. But I, certain aspects, certain aspects, I think you're incredible. I'm, I'm good. I'm good at certain things. So at school, did they recognize that talent and put you in different classes or special? No, I was just always called in the top groups for things. I went to an ordinary, you know, public. Any bullying and stuff like that? There, there, was, there was quite a lot of that. Yes, it was actually quite a challenging thing for me coming up. I didn't really have friends, but that's because I didn't really understand social dynamics. It's one of the things that led to... Um, the severe social anxiety and severe general anxiety that actually led to my diagnosis in the first place. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm I'm oddly grateful mm-hmm. for that because otherwise I wouldn't have known and I wouldn't be in a position now where I get to harness the strength of those gifts rather than just being subject to the downside. Mm-hmm. And um, your dad was an entrepreneur? No, actually, my dad's um, a serial learner put this way my dad was in his 40s got bored went and did another law degree he already had a phd and two masters or two phds and a master so he's, like, smart. he's smart, smart yeah he's very very book smart but does he use that education what do you think of education there's a theory i think i first heard it from tony robbins and i think a lot more people are jumping on the bandwagon now that the education system was built on the back of the victorian workhouse system in order to train people to be good workers yeah. ring the bell sit in line do what you're told pay your taxes die which i I can't refute the evidence that that's what it is. Even when you look at the workplaces move forward, the world has moved forward, but the education system hasn't really moved forward. And and so I think there is a a role that education plays, but anyone that thinks that education is going to save them is in trouble. And anyone who doesn't move outside of traditional education to actually educate themselves on the world and how it operates is going to be in trouble. Do you have children? I have one son who's two and a half. Okay. Your son comes to you and says, Dad, I'm 17 now. Should I go into university mm-hmm. or should I follow your, mm-hmm. you know, your path and become an entrepreneur? What mm-hmm. would you advise him? Because I had this. Oh, you had this yourself. Yeah. So another one coming. Another one coming. So my intention mm-hmm. for Ethan is that I create a conducive environment for him to know who he is and to make empowering choices way before he's 17 years old. So I would like to think that we haven't got to the point that he's 17 and not really know what to do. However, I would say that not everybody's built to walk the path that I've walked. And yet, successful gainful employment doesn't necessarily require you to go to university. But university as a life experience, I think is a very good one for people to go through. And so... I say this to my nephews and nieces. I've got a lot of nephews and nieces. A few of them getting to that age, a couple of them have gone past that age. And I've encouraged them to go to university, but to have it as an experience of life, make new relationships and get to meet new people, learn some stuff too, pick a subject that you're interested in, but don't expect that that's going to be the thing that's going to save you. Yeah. Just in case. Just in case. Just or It doesn't exist anymore. Even just, do you, are you excited about the prospect of learning about, so for example, my nephew Jude, he's starting university in September. He's really passionate about music and music production. He's been, he's a prolific drummer and plays a lot of other instruments as well. Really, really um, coming up on the gospel music scene in London. Like, 
I, I, I'm excited that the fact that he's studying music and business, some passion, because it's something he's passionate, passionate about. Passion into some finances and security. But at the same the time, business. supporting him in developing, I've, I've trained all my nephews and nieces on at least basic entrepreneurial skills um, so that he's not dependent on that to pay the bills, mm -hmm. right? But at the same time, he's going to take this time, move out from home, go and have three, four years away and, and grow up a little bit, mm -hmm. right? And do something that he's passionate about. So basically, you say to Ethan, yes, you yep. say, do whatever you want to do because I've, I have faith in you because we've been working together for the last 17 years. Exactly. Okay. Now, Gary V says, save you the money, send around the world. Mm -hmm. You have to experience all this around the world. How mm -hmm. do you feel about that? If that's what Ethan's passionate about, then, then yeah. I want him to do that. And yeah. one of the things I'm really interested in, as soon as he gets to sort of about five or six years old, me and his mum aren't together anymore. Okay. Uh, so he's here? He's moving here in September. Oh, cool. Yeah, he's moving in September. I think it's uh, important. Yeah, I'm excited about that. Um, I want to take trips with him. I want him to come with me on business trips, cool. right? And, and come and experience more of the world and see if that's what he wants to do. Even in terms of like activities and hobbies, I have like a couple of areas I'd ideally like him to have hobbies in. I'd love him to have a team sport. So he learns about camaraderie and teamwork, right? I want him to have like a, a solo sport. So he learns about competition and drive and hard work. I want him to have something mental and something fun and also martial art. However, I'm not forcing those on him. I'm getting him introduced. I'm introducing him and the ones that he's interested in, then I'll support him with those. So even in terms of chess, like I'm really passionate about him learning chess. Do you play chess? I do. Yeah. Good stamina. Ah, uh, I'm like 16, 16. I'm not like a, like a 16, 15, 1600. I'm like a, a middling player, right? I'm working on that. I'm working on improving it. But I've had him like messing around with chess pieces and moving pieces around the chessboard since he was one years old. Yes. So that he's at least familiar. I read it in, I think it was in Matthew Syed's book, Bounce, where he spoke about this chess master that wanted to prove that chess can be taught. And he did that with his kids. And, and they were small. It. He gave them like little chess pieces and got them into it and excited. And yeah. all of his kids got to at least a master level. Wow. Yeah. It's like footballers. They say, give your child a football. football. They go to bed with and stuff. Same like thing that. with Ethan. They get used to it. Yeah. And we kick the ball around with him and he <laughs> loves doing that. <laughs> and so it's something, you know, especially being a Brit, you know, I, I think that's like a, a big Who do you support? I'm West Ham. You're rubbish. <laughs> I'm in Liverpool. I'm, 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 loyal, I'm, loyal, I'm loyal to my I'm loyal to my local team yeah, in East yeah. London. But yeah, same but with you the... stay though. Congratulations. Oh, oh, oh thank God. Um I might, I'll never hear the end of it from my brothers crying and here went down again. Don't tell no, me. no, my brother my brother's West Ham as well. All my family oh, West Ham. No, All my family West Ham. Well, one of my nephews, his daddy's Arsenal, so he's all Arsenal and West Ham. But is that whereabouts you were East East? East London, yeah, East End, East End Stratford. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well. So um yeah, that's that's what we've done with Ethan. Same thing, kicking around the ball. And he enjoys it. He enjoys kicking around the ball on the grass. So have him do that with the team, build some camaraderie, so on and so forth. Um, I'm, I've been doing martial arts since I was about six. I don't really enjoy striking martial arts now that I'm getting older. Uh, and I think that um, something like Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is a lot more challenging because mm -hmm. it's more difficult to get to a black belt. So I'd love to kind of throw him into that when he's four or five years old. To see how do. That. Yeah. They love it. Yeah, it's good stuff. At seven. At seven. We have your own private teacher comes with them and at the back they do Oh really? Yeah. Jiu Jitsu. He's he's Mexican Mexican. Okay. Black belt. Oh, okay. I, I need to get some deets from you on that. Done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. So um you're going to business. Uh, you, your siblings, any of them entrepreneurs or anything like this? I think we've all got entre entrepreneurial streak, but we've all rec I think one thing is that my siblings are blessed to recognize that some of them are better operators than they are entrepreneurs but they're all successful in their they're own. all successful in their own fields um but my brother's more of a pure entrepreneur we do more entrepreneurial stuff together we're building up a, an assisted living business that we want to exit at the moment we've got construction business that we do together and some other bits and pieces uh we've got some trucking stuff that we do in south africa um my sisters tend to chip in on those and get residuals my baby sister is really into um hospitality that's what she's really passionate about so she's got some catering stuff that she does as well as having her, her, her job my sister that comes just after me again she's got some entrepreneurial things on the side but she's doing very well she's vice vice president level in the company she works with yeah. and then my uh my older sister she's again like senior man junior management level in a pharmacy you have a stable school. household you had a stable parents yep yep I mean, parents that helped I think it can have a say, having a stable household, 
but I don't think it's the only thing because there are plenty of people with stable households yeah, yeah. that end up on drugs or whatever, right? Or was it a conversation in the house was all positive and driven, or your dad's smart, your mom's smart? Something that you can look back and think, this is why we all five of us done pretty good. I think it's the value systems. So very conservative Christian household. Mm -hmm. So they were put there. I know you mentioned divine a few times. Is yeah. That a Christian divine, or do you mean just the universe, the great being? So I I was the person that was the annoying person that questioned the pastor all the time with weird <laughs> questions. Mm -hmm. So a lot of things didn't really make sense to me from a biblical perspective. And as I went on my own journey, certainly studying for myself, studying books like, for example, the Anuma Elish, which have got a number of stories that really match the Bible. Uh, starting to look at other faiths and seeing well hang on half of these stories are the same just with different names Correct. but there's some differences and so i dropped the identity of christianity. of christianity because my philosophy is that we're all looking at the same brick from different directions i call it purple brick theory even if you look at polytheistic religions like for example hinduism or ancient ones like ancient egyptian faith yeah. or whatever They've all still got a head honcho that has the same qualities as we might in Islamic Judeo Christian the concept. Greeks, the same, They've all got like a yeah. top dog. Yes. And even if you go into scripture, there are always almost lieutenants of the divine that are doing jobs. If you read in Revelation, for example, in the Bible, you've got these people, you've got the beast, you've got the seraphim, you've got cherubim. When you see that they've all got a job to do, and you go, for example, do the Hindu faith, and you see, well, the gods in Hinduism are expressions of the universe that are undertaking particular jobs in the world of man. Mm -hmm. So it's it's not too dissimilar. It's not too dissimilar. And I found that that's given me the ability to find what we might call God in everything. I can go to a temple, I can go to a mosque, I can go to a synagogue and understand that I'm amongst people who are just having their own experience of God. What do you think of God? What do you think of uh different dimensions to what you think i know we're going but let's go <laughs> because, was... because that's because i'm a thinker right mm -hmm. very much probably like you i question mm -hmm. everything mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, i'm dyslexic okay so i've never fit in the education system i always question things you know mm -hmm. and um i think it's a it's a question that we may never be able to answer the seven day thing the, yeah you know adam adam and eve and you know science says one thing Time is a dimension, are there a million dimensions? <laughs> I think maybe in our little, this is my thought, in our mm -hmm. little pittance world and universe mm -hmm. of three dimensions, mm -hmm. yes, we need a simple story mm -hmm. so it makes sense to us. Mm -hmm. I think there is a, a an energy. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be a beginning and an end. Mm -hmm. Does it have to be an up and a down? You mm -hmm. know, so I just think in our brains we simplify things called things heaven mm -hmm. hell mm -hmm. i'm not sure if they do exist i mean even when you That's look at i mean even when you look at the, the 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 christian concept of hell it doesn't actually show up in the bible it came from Don, dante's inferno a poem that was written in the 1700s or 1400s or something like that and it became a part of dogma and then became a part of what you know people people taught um i think what's most imperative and this is what I seek for myself and what I invite other people to do. Find your own simplification or complication that makes sense for you and empowers you to live life in a way that you can represent the highest ideals that we know. Your values. Right? Your values. We all, as humans, we all agree it's better to be a nice person than a crap person, mm -hmm. right? I think it was Ricky Gervais that said, you can summarize all of these holy books in one word, don't be a C right like as long as you don't do that sure, sure, sure. you're winning at life and i think sometimes we get so complicated so over committed to the idea of trying to work things out or to make sense of things we don't do what we're here to do which is to live well, we lose the whole purpose of our we're here to live we're here to live and have a life experience have you had death in your family have yeah. you experienced that I've experienced that but for me death's a part of life and i don't know if it's because of the way that i'm wired that i'm able to see the simplicity of that that it's part of the cycle of life and even when we look at you know, a lot of the evidence that's come about the fact that we are metaphysical and physical at the same time. I don't believe that physical death is the end of our experience as a true being. Whether that means that we return to the light and we become a, a, a spirit, I don't know. And I, I, I will never know that until I pop my clogs and I had myself. I experience. 
Okay. And I went with the, it was last November in Mexico. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I found the shaman with happy DMT because you have to get it from happy frogs, not yep. miserable frogs. Yeah. You, you know that? Be yeah. Bufo. I've done before. Yeah. Oh, happy. Yeah. yeah. So, mm -hmm. uh, and my question was, my intention was to see if this, what happens after death when you die. Mm -hmm. And I experienced my death. And for 56 years, mm -hmm. there was never a day or night I didn't go to bed thinking about death because I've faced death since the age of three. Mm -hmm. The left eyes and the people in, my, in front of me died, mm -hmm. my family. And I got the answer. And it was to the light. And the message was, you just pass information. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? And since then, I've slept soundly every night. Because you've got the opportunity. I, I, again, it's like you've got something to graph now, the mind. Because, yeah. I mean, our minds are trying to make sense of things because it needs to make sense of things in order correct, to, correct. to, to back and forth back and forth right yeah. so now you've been able to make sense of it you can see there's nothing mm -hmm. to really think about to fear to think about nothing exactly it's beautiful experience mm -hmm. love it love it, love it. Yeah, it was a real beautiful what part of mexico were you in uh cancun okay yeah but then this lady's american mm -hmm. and brazilian mm -hmm. she travels so i just right. walked her in the travels we have a timeshare in mexico so mm -hmm. i just make sure it's coincided with oh, that nice yeah. nice nice so, and the fact is i didn't know that I'm sure you know, but if you have something that's natural, you don't become addicted to it. Yeah, you only become thing. addicted to synthetic, synthetic. Things, right? And I know that the shaman that I do a lot of work with, shout out to Tim. Um, he's actually supported a lot of people breaking addiction through using these natural medicines like Bufo. What does he Gamma. practice? So he's actually, um, he's got like a host of medicines that he's practiced, but he's like, local mexican went to like a university for shamanism been in the jungle for 27 years he's been like this is all he does this is all he does mm -hmm. um it was really interesting because i've never really been interested in it i've never done ayahuasca or any of that stuff no you know yeah, yeah. not knocking I've thought it about it but it was just it's just never cool i didn't like the process of being sick and it, did, it, did, it didn't really really appeal to me at all and i've never been called and a lot of people are like, oh yeah, yeah never really called me and then um a friend of mine had a really, really positive experience of microdosing. And so I called around a couple of people that I know because I've been based out of Mexico myself for the last five years. Well, I didn't know. Yeah, in Los Cabos on the West Coast. Okay. Yeah. And um, I was saying, you know, can someone, I want to speak to someone and understand more about mm -hmm. this stuff so I can sort of make an informed decision. A friend of mine introduced me to a friend who introduced me to Tim. We go to sit down and I'm sitting there thinking in my head of the things I wanted to work on. And then he looked at me and he says, Nothing. No, he says, it's not the microdosing you need. This is the medicine that's calling you. This and this, and this is what it's for. Yes, this, 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 this. He finds you. He said exactly what was going on in my head. He said exactly what the medicine was for. So I said, okay, I'll give him a try. And so we we did a, we did a, a, a little season of work together. Yeah. How many times more? So we did um, Cambo three times. And then off, after the third Cambo, we went and did Bufo over a 20, 20 day period. So it was quite intense. Oh, really? Yeah, quite intense. I just had that 20 minute experience. I don't want to go back. <laughs> I got the answer. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Beautiful experience. Yeah. But I don't have the need. I got the answer. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, I mean, I know people that have got their own Bufo frog in the house and they harvest it yeah, they do it every weekend. Yeah, you know, frog. Yeah, frog. frog. Yeah, yeah. But, um, and there are people, but I see, I do see why with the Bufo, because for me, it was very, a very profound experience. And I understand why people do get addicted, not addicted to it, but they want to keep going back to it. Yes. But I think it's a testament also to the mind of the person who's doing it, that you're not going to fill a gap. You're going to get an answer and then you're, you're hold to go forward. And this is one of the reasons why I kind of speak out a little bit about the popularity of these medicines, because they weren't designed to be as recreational as they've exactly. become. Um, but that's my, that's my personal opinion. I don't, I don't shade, no shade on anyone who is into that. It's just, that's my personal opinion. I love LSD. Mm -hmm. I've never tried it. Really? Never tried it. You should. The only time I've ever done anything was by once by accident. I had MDMA once by accident. I've never even tried weed. Never. We uh, sometimes go to Amsterdam and try it. Try it. Yeah. But, um, give you a quick story. We had some MDMA and my mate by accident put it in my heart tablet so i'm having a meeting so i start getting emotional in the boardroom <laughs> i start crying oh wow and the driver's taking me home going i love you <laughs> you've been with me seven years and i just love you so much so i went to the maid and said what the hell happened she goes that means, sir i put the normal medicine I said, but didn't you see this one had a yellow smile on it <laughs> you, you realize well, the star with a yellow smile it's not the one that i normally have every day not the one yeah yeah, yeah but it was an emotional <laughs> emotional journey oh wow
yeah, I'm open to things, but you know, if it doesn't harm you, it yeah. doesn't harm anyone, try it once, see how, yeah, it goes. see how it goes. And I think it's important, again, going back to the whole thing about the heart speaking to you, what the device seeks to speak through you. And I believe we get these micro messages of guidance mm -hmm. all the time. It could be to make that phone call. It could be to start the business or not, to go on that date or not go on that date, whatever the thing is. And I think part and parcel of things like spiritual practice, like meditation and breath work is getting into, yeah, yeah. I've been a d diligent meditator for many, many years. It gives you the space to be able to hear those messages and to be able to actually be in coordination with that communication. Cool. Mm. Your first business. My first business, I think, was a breakfast in bed service mm -hmm. in the house. Um, no, the one that made you rich. In your oh, life. that one. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a lot of breakfast. Oh, that was, that, was, <laughs> that was breakfast in bed. So it started. So what happened was there's a company called, that was called Gem Discounts. I don't think they're called the same thing anymore. And Gem Discounts, what they were, they were catalog returns bulk purchase. So you buy these pallets. Very familiar with it. Yeah. Right. So I used to do this for... Um, uh, J.D. Williams, J. It was it was the third. They call M. Brown Group. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Big from Manchester. Yeah. Mm. So I was I buying the buy bulk uh, shoes, size six shoes, all left foot, all left foot. So, yeah. And I'll tell you another. Thing. Yeah, that <laughs> That's hard selling them afterwards. That yeah. was a bit. But yeah, you get these mixed palettes. Um, you spend one two thousand pounds on the palette, but it's mixed. You don't know what's in there. Sometimes you get a PlayStation, a couple of TVs, some irons, some return clothes. And basically, we're selling those. And so that's, you buy them in bulk. Buy them in bulk. Bring them to a home, a garage. So what we're doing is buying it. Um, buying it. I had a storage unit. Uh, there was a distro center called uh, in Deptford. I think it was. Was it Deptford? I think it was Deptford or Dartford. Dartford. Deptford. And we had a really cool situation with them where we could buy you, things. We, you and your brother? No. This was me and a, um, a guy that I knew through a guy that went to church with. Okay. How old were you then? I was 18. Wow. at this time so he knew people that would buy the goods and he so what happened when he used to cut my hair is what happened so i was waiting for him and i was on his sister's computer looking up to buy stock he looks at my shoulders oh that's really cool i could vlog that all day long it's like really and so we ended up partnering up but i put up the money i had the organization the operations and he was helping to, to sell it off and then over time i just found other things i could get hold of i found a company that uh, used to go to buy cars at auction on your behalf so you'd give them an order and a set of specs. You couldn't give exact. You'd have to give them like three colors, three things or whatever, yeah, like a wider thing. Material. But they were getting them for up to half price off. So I charged 200 pounds for the search. And then we put a little bit of markup on the car and we, we made money doing that. Then I found out, I learned about trade finance and that's where the game changed for me. So for those who aren't familiar with trade finance, you can get much the way you can get like a, like a credit card or a bank loan. There are private companies that will allow you, that will issue a letter of credit on your behalf for you to buy goods. Yes. Um, and then you pay them like a fee for correct. them to be able to do that. Banks used to do that. Lloyd's Bank used to do that a lot. Yes. Oh, they used to do that for pro for private customers? Or yes, correct. Uh, businesses. Businesses. And so I pay between 5 and 6% for a letter of credit. Mm -hmm. And so my mission was find any goods, liquid goods, that have at least a 10% margin. Because guess what? And then you're doubling your money every time. Mm -hmm. And so that's what really, really blew me up. And then what we did was we got um, investors to put so the money up. you were up. borrowing money at 5%? essentially yes. getting money at 10 percent and keeping the margin there we go and then i was actually getting the five percent from investors cool so investors putting up the five percent uh i'm giving them 50 percent back and i'm making the difference and then we're just scaling that so there was no problem getting supplies oh no 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 because i was always looking for things that are so i was really so at the time i was really heavy into like my conscious creation -y stuff so i'd be visualizing all the time and and i would always 18. yeah this was 18 oh, and so i was getting opportunities come to me, like someone come and say, oh, I can get coffee beans. Oh, do you know anyone that's got coffee beans? Oh, I've got someone that's got um, it, whatever. It, this needed tech, being tech savvy, right? Not so even really. Searches were online. Phone calls. Phone calls. Phone calls. Or people come into the office for one thing and it ends what up being something completely different. What, how long did that last and why? What happened was it's illegal to have investors put money up for something if you haven't got a license. So government came and shut me down. So it's just bullshit technicality. Bullshit tech. I mean, if the paperwork had said loan with my investors, it would be completely different. Completely different. But I, this is the thing. Obviously, there's been years of resentment. This is, but ultimately, these laws are in place to protect people, right? They're in law against the, against. You know, I, I say this. You know, have you seen, have you been to these shops where they said two items only? You can only take two items to, to get changed in the change oh, yeah, rooms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
You know why they do that? Because most thefts happen in the changing rooms. Oh. So most in innocent people have yeah. to pay the price for a few thieves. A few now, the moment you do that, guess what happens? Thieves find another way of stealing. It's the way that it the goes. innocent pay for a very small percentage of people who can abuse the system. I mean, the the thing oh, we're going to go off on a really bad political tangent now, but even when you look at the the, the conversation happening in the US now about the Second Amendment right to bear arms. Yeah. And, you know, you've got one side, people are saying, well, if there were no guns, there would be none of these school shootings and you wouldn't have shootings on the street. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the other side. Well, it's the not bad guys will have guns. The bad guys will have to defend look, themselves. Yeah. It, and so it's exactly the same situation. Obviously, more mortally sad in that instance, because you do have you know people. Two hundred and something mass shootings a year in the US mm -hmm. plus armed violence or whatever. But yeah, so. It's the the innocent that do get to pay, but I do understand. But the bottom line was that, yeah, everything got seized. They come in, sorry, you're not allowed to do that. You broke the law, and they came and took everything. You did press charges. Yeah. Uh, they did eventually. Yes, that went all the way to. A... Do you think it made a difference because you're black? I felt there was prejudice against me. This is the thing. Part of me doesn't want to accept the reality of things, but I've been in rooms of all shapes and sizes and calibers mm -hmm. all over the world mm -hmm. and there's no smoke without fire mm -hmm. i don't allow this narrative to hold me back of course but i do you, acknowledge uh -huh. but i do, I do, do spot it you know do don't use that as maybe i've used it as an inspiration to be honest with you i'm with you i mean even down to like even when you look at the divisiveness whether it's real or not the divisiveness that the narrative creates is real yes and so it's one of the reasons why you know i wouldn't raise my son in the us because it's so divisive mm -hmm. right it's your son half british uh, but full british yeah his mum's um his mum's russian oh wow okay you yeah so met her been... here or... no i actually met her in uh we're at a meditation retreat in mexico Mexico. but she was living in the states at the time okay. yeah it's real but it's not true again right the truth is is that if we open us take up everybody's skin so the same but the reality is is that we do look different and that difference in in appearance does create narratives that people hold on to propagate and based on their condition or beliefs and whether they i mean i remember i was so I, ignorance when i was about 12 we moved to a predominantly white area and put it this way when i finished secondary school at 15 years old we took a picture of the entire school and faculty you were the only person in no not the only thing family there, out of 880 people in that picture roughly including staff there were 18 ethnics in the picture i was the only one the only one the only one my teacher used to call me black cherry i didn't know the word wog <laughs> i was called wog by my peer group where was this uh wilmslow a school called Riley's. Ronaldo's kids just left there before he went to Saudi Arabia. I mean, again, but I was I'm 20 years old. Than you, so. But but this is the thing. Again, these are narratives that people are propagating. And what I found, and this is one of the things that I found. I remember I was going home um, from school with David and Gary. We we're walking. We lived near to each other, so we we're walking home from school. This is year 10, so my fourth of five years at secondary school. Just to give um context for everyone these guys have eaten in my house they've slept in my house i've slept in their house i've eaten in their house and after four years we're walking home and uh i saw them sort of wink at each other and like david comes over and goes dan I just want to tell you didn't really know any color people before i met you but do you know what color people are all right four years later yeah. i used to ride a bike in my neighborhood mm -hmm. And there was a policeman who used to pick on me. Really? And I walk, I'd, I'd ride on the pavement, age 14. Mm -hmm. He'll drive all the way around the block to tell me to walk on the pavement. And I'd ride a bike. Mm -hmm. This is a policeman, mm. adult policeman. Mm. When uh, I used to work for a company, mm -hmm. I uh, made, I think, I kind of, my commission was $1.5 million in 18 months. Nice. They didn't pay me, American company. Oh, really? uh catholics uh, from um what was that bombing uh, 
he blew up the uh, the government himself. He's an American guy. He just they 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 killed him. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Um, I say to him, "Where's my contract?" They'll pull out the Bible and say, "We live by the Bible. This is our contract." And then they didn't pay. You. They didn't pay me. Hmm. One point five million dollars. I took him to court, and the day I went, the, the day I said to them, "Hey, this is it. They fired me." Okay, and then my contract of employment, I did have a contract of employment, not the commission one. Mm -hmm. He said that I had a BMW 3 Series, okay, and they said we're taking a car off you. Mm -hmm. So you're not taking it, it's part of my contract. So we called the police, the police came. Mm -hmm. I said to the man, I said, hey, listen, this is part of my contract. They have to give me 30 days notice and I'm very nice. He says, you're under arrest, give the car back. Right, o Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And um, literally, he, he put handcuffs on me, mm -hmm. took the car keys, they searched all my everything because i didn't know i was going to get fired that day mm -hmm. so she, all my bags everything in front of me they opened it up mm -hmm. put it i put it on so i took the car I had to get a cap home i don't know i was a father of two you know the embarrassment of it mm. i went to court i won the case you know how much they gave me fifteen thousand pounds because the judge in the industrial tribunal couldn't understand somebody earning 1.5 million dollars in 18 months they didn't have so the guy right? wrote me a check, mm -hmm. wrote me a check. He said, I knew you were going to win. I knew I wasn't going to pay you 1.5 million. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing. When the policemen came, I felt because they were white mm -hmm. and I wasn't. Mm -hmm. Okay, he arrested me. Mm -hmm. They were right. I was wrong. But a lot of this comes from ignorance, mm -hmm. right? I went to the police complaints authority. Mm -hmm. They came over. I said, okay, I get it. You made a mistake. Get him to come and apologize to me. He refused to come. I said, you're sorry. I said, Does, is there any on your records? I said, no, there won't be anything on his records. Well, just tell him to come and say sorry to me. No, mm -hmm. nothing. He never came. You know, it makes you pretty pissed off, right? It does. When I moved to a particular neighborhood, the policeman used to stop me regularly. He said, don't let me put you off living in this neighborhood. Maybe it's north of Watford. I don't know. But those... I, I just, I, I, for me, it's not even about being north of Watford. I think it's people that are operating from a limited experience exposure and understanding maybe fear even but the fear comes but, from the unknown you know what don't you idiot you're creating animosity you're creating anger because you know what i was i was i didn't like the police because of those experiences mm -hmm. i'll give you another example mm -hmm. had a business got investigated long story for uh, uh short changing the vat or something mm -hmm. okay and I had about 300,000 pounds in one account, mm -hmm. several accounts. Mm -hmm. And I got, I said to my accountant, let's just pay him. Mm -hmm. investing. I can't be had it's 30,000 pounds, just pay him. Mm -hmm. I don't really want to say they're wrong, going mm -hmm. through mm -hmm. arbitration and all that business. Went to pay them, all my bank accounts are frozen. Because in 18 something something, if the taxman is investigating you, they put it in the London Gazette, and if you appear in the London Gazette, all your bank accounts get frozen. So I couldn't pay it. I went bust. I had hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pounds in my account. Mm -hmm. Can you believe that? No, that's not discriminating. That's just like you're talking about the government can come. Come and do what they want. And I had staff. Mm -hmm. I had employees. They all lost their position. Oh, wow. Because it was a stupid investigation. Mm -hmm. Not guilty. Mm -hmm. just, it, it was a set date. Such as, and the banking guys got frozen until that date. Hmm. But this is, again, I think this is why I say that not everybody's built for the game of entrepreneurship that's why i love to buy <laughs> england yeah you know, I, do you know i felt as an entrepreneur i felt like as an employer that i felt like i worked 28 29 days for the mm -hmm. government and mm -hmm. my staff mm -hmm. the last two days were on my, for me mm -hmm. you pay tax vat national yep. insurance salaries this mm -hmm. this, this last it was it was a february i was screwed mm -hmm. not enough days in a month right mm -hmm. that was a joke by the way oh got you <laughs> but i think one of the great things about the world that we're in right now is that we do have the flexibility to move to different areas mm -hmm. and to work in different areas. Not all of us. If we're lucky to have British passports, we are. So I sit with people who are super genius, but they can't travel because they've got Iranian passports. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's a bit of an extreme one. There are ways around for, for many. But yeah, when you look at stuff like um, blacklisted countries and so on and so forth, it does get a bit box proxy. I mean, they can come here. Yes, they can come here. There are places that you might can... be able to get visas. That's another matter. That's another thing. But at least they can visit, you know. So, so that closed. Mm -hmm. you, didn't, you didn't quit. No. Um, again, I had the arrogance of youth. So I thought I'm going to be smart this time. So I put everything in other people's names. Went off and did it again within about a year. Same business. No. So what had happened was 
coming towards the the end of that experience, people were coming up to me saying, Dan, can I pick your brain? So, and then people started offering me money to pick my brain. And the time that I knew I was onto something when the guy offered me a thousand pounds to pick my brain for an hour. Well, this man will pay me a thousand pounds to pick my brain for an hour. And that's when I understood. So coming off, I was on my brother's sofa. Um, I was like, oh, hang on a minute. I've got a brain that people will pay me for. What about if I go out to the network of people that I've met through all of this business I've been doing and said, I will come in and do problem solving for you and brainstorming for you, but I want a thousand pounds an hour. And then after a while, I was be like 20. I am nine. I'm, yeah, I've literally just turned 20 this time. I'm, this is March 2003. So you had pretty high self-worth. Yeah, but again, I, I mean, your self-worth comes from your experience and I hadn't had anything to tell me that I wasn't worth that, right? People paid. People paid. And it just shows if you ask. If you ask. And this is more like I would say to like um, people that are middling, selling lower ticket items or whatever as, as any kind of business or consultancy or coach or whatever. Mm. There are 8 billion people in the world. Pitch a bit higher. And there's always someone who's on a desert island and will pay for that coconut. Mm -hmm. And if you've got the coconuts, they'll pay a lot for that coconut. Find the pain, offer the pain. <laughs> right. And that's it. Um, and so I was doing that and then I realized, hang on a minute, I get stakes in these projects. And so I started charging a 10 or 15,000 pound retainer. I can't remember. And I wanted equity slices instead. So I had cash flow because I had, I had retainers coming in and then I was getting equity slices on projects that might be a year or two years. People honored them. People honored them. Why did that go belly up? Uh, because the, the people whose names I put everything in <laughs> nicked everything. <laughs> Although you were the you were the, the the trigger, you were the one who was actually bringing. Yeah, it yeah, it was all in other short sightedness. Yeah, you didn't choose them. Well. The, uh, well, the naivety of youth. Again, I didn't, I didn't know what I didn't know. Yeah, so you believe it. I still believe in people, but um, what's the Arabic phrase? Trust in God, trust in Allah, but tie your camel. <laughs> so, so how long were you doing that for? A couple of years. Uh, yeah, for a couple of years. Um, so that went, and then um. So that you were running around. You were busy. You yeah, were I was. Working. I was. I was. And that one took me out. After that, that's when I was in really, really bad place. After that, because the thing is, so much of my identity was tied up in being the guy that knew everything, and suddenly you uh, it proved you were proved wrong with those two instances. Yeah, but detrimentally so because my entire identity was tied up in being the guy that knew everything. Are you a millionaire now? I am, yeah, now we we do seven figures on our businesses now. Yeah. What business did you have? Uh, my personal development business. I got my two comma club award last year for that one. The, the award? two two comma club award. What's the, it so click funnels, they audit your business. Uh -huh. And if it's done uh click funnels just in the US company. Yeah, the US company. Wow. So if you've done through their platform, if you've done at least seven figures, they will audit you and they audit the granted wow. it took nine months. It took nine months for them to audit. So you got clients all over the world. Yeah, all over right. the world. And, and I've what got programs you have. So we've got the, the signature program has always been um, micro to millions. Do you mind if I look like? Right. Yeah. So I'll, I'll buy. Yeah. So micro to millions is a really cool program. So the actual, so you need mindset, you need emotional resilience, but you need strategy, right? And the way that I made my first million strategically was through taking baby steps through a particular system that I learned from one of my first mentors, a guy called Stuart Goldsmith. So the way that it worked was um, I read Stuart's book, The Midas Method, when I was 18. And I wrote the publisher, I sent a handwritten letter through the post. And I said, you know, I'm really been inspired by this book. I would love for Stuart to be my mentor. And if you pass this letter on to him, and he wrote me back. And so no. he was my pen pal mentor. And then he told me about an experiment that he was doing. This is 2000, yeah, 2001, 2002. Do you have people asking you to be their mentor now? Yeah. Three. Yeah. They do you do. say yes? Depends. Ah, oh, God, don't say yes. Anymore. It depends. It depends. If somebody just comes to take, mm -hmm. then it's you a no. You don't appreciate it anyway, right? But it's a no if they just come to take. If someone brings something into my life and seeks my wisdom and experience in exchange, then they it's understand the game. Brain, yeah. They understand the game. Because for me, when I, I've got mentors, generally I pay or have paid to have access to them. But I don't go to take. I go to pour in and get what I can in the overflow at that point. That's my approach. So anyone who approaches the same way that I do, I'll happily 
pass it on. Other than that, it's I've got books, go and read the books. I've got podcasts, go and read go watch podcasts, you know? Um, but yeah, so Stuart's experiment was if you take a penny and double it 28 times with some rounding up and down, it takes you to 1.6 million. And so he set this very, very strict rules for a game where he wanted people to go through this experiment because he wanted to know how many people would make it. So you had to find a penny on the floor. You had to use the exact. It was really, really strict rules. People quit by they quit. Fourteen. Yeah, they 14, they, yeah. they quit. They just don't see it compounding. They don't. They don't see it. I made it all the way. I was one of the people that made it all the way. That's the the formula that I was using in my mind. And so when I when I was making the decision that I was so when I started getting the call to come and do what the the personal development side and to share my experience, I was like, I kind of like. The business that i've got now and then course of events happened the partners i was working with actually took the gutted the bit they didn't steal the business they gutted it and so it ended up not being worth as much and then i had to build it back up again and blah blah blah, blah. and i was like well hang on a minute i've got a formula to be able to make some money if i go back to that formula then i can just make some money and so back in the day back in then there were all these like little online forums and bulletin boards of people that were sharing ideas it was like this little secret community of us un underground and so I went and started looking for those communities to see if it was still going on. And there weren't really any. But one of Stuart's business partners, a guy called Barry, had developed a program of mentorship where he took you through 14 steps from 100 to 1.6 instead of starting from zero. And I started to do that program and I got stuck at about 12 grand. I was like, I don't understand why I'm stuck. By this time, I've done it twice. Religiously. Done. I've done it twice. And the third time I got to 120 grand, but I needed the money. So I used the money. So coming to do it was like, why can I not do it? And I realized I was a very different person to the person who tried to do it before. And so I realized, well, now I was very much into community because I was much more deeply into my spiritual practice and into spiritual communities, more into connection. I was more into, um, less into the hustle, which is a big part of what I was doing before and more into an aligned way of doing things. So I had to change. So the success that I'd had with that model wasn't going to work unless I changed how I was relating to it. And off the back of that, I was like, well, hang on a minute. What if I created my own community of people? And that's when we started the Micro to Millions community where I took people through from the 14-step model. We looked at my model using Beyond Intention. You what, created your own. I created my own. And, um, and but is this like trademarks, what you have now? You don't bother trademarks. It's not trademarks, but the, the model is unique mm -hmm. because of how I teach it. Money DNA is trademarked. One how of my do concepts. people know about this? Um, so I did one post. On my Facebook page, and we made over hundred thousand with that post, with people jumping into the program, and then we had people referring. And over the so, did you I, have a big following then? Nope, nope. I had a five hundred person email list, just the normal friends I had around. And what did the letter say? I just, I, I just said, hey, I had this model that I used Got a few years ago here. here to here. I'm doing it again, and as part of it, we're going to make sure that everybody gives a portion of what they create to charity. If you're in, let me know. But there was no buy-in. There was no. It wasn't. It wasn't like. I charge you a hundred dollars to do it. No, but then they did. I did. I was charging for it, but I didn't, I was expecting. So this is the crazy thing. I had the epiphany in the barber's chair. This barber's chair. Yeah, a lot of <laughs> things coming out. Yeah. I, I want to go to that barber's chair <laughs> when I grow up. When I grow up there. I'm in the barber's chair. I was like, and this has been like a year and a half after I tried and got stuck at the 12 and a half grand. And I was kind of noodling on it. And it was like, oh my goodness. Number one. There wasn't a giving aspect, which is a big part of me, but the tithing aspect, number one, and number two, the community aspect. And I was going to do like a sales page and stuff the next day on like lead pages or whatever we're using. But I just did the Facebook post and I didn't even get the time to do any kind of funnel. It was, I originally said 20 places, they sold out in one day. Then I opened up another 10 spaces, they sold out. Then another 10 and it ended up getting to 70 people. Like that. Was this automated or you manually ran the whole thing for? What? I manually did it. We were using Teachable before and loading up everything on Teachable and I was doing it live. Was this? So then, this is 2018. So not that long ago. No, 2018. And so, um, so before that, you yeah. were an entrepreneur looking for things. No, but, but between, so from spring 2018 to the back end of summer 2018, I was completely dedicated just giving away what I was sharing. I was, I had closed up everything. I was, I had a backpack, a suitcase and a suit carrier. And I was literally traveling around the world, renting rooms and saying, please come on and teach you about beyond intention for free. Just come. And, and then what happened after a while is people like, oh, this is really good stuff. 
can you come here? And they would rent the room and put people in the room. They pay for my travel and give me somewhere to stay. And then it was one of my friends, a guy called Barry. He just had like a nine figure exit around that time. He was closing it out. It hadn't come in yet. He was closing it out. And I'd done an event in Northern California. It was a really cool event, actually. We had like this thing with um, um, biofeedback therapy with horses and we mixed in Beyond Intention with that. And it was, it was a really fun day. And he came to support it. And he was dropping me off that day. And he said, Dan, I really feel I've got to tell you this. I think it's great that you're giving all of this stuff away. He said, but I think you, if you think about it, if you let the abundance in, think how many more people you could help. Exactly. Fill your cup first. And I was like, that day I realized, okay, because a lot of people said, hey, I want to work with you one-on-one. I want to do this. And I was like, no, 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 no. I just want to do the thing. So I opened it up and then I moved. I went to visit Los Cabos in October. Um, I was meant to stay for three days, ended up never leaving. But during that time that I was there, that first 10 days, I had my, I made my first 10,000. Um, I was happy every day, so on and so forth. And everything was just flowing and, and, and rolling. And then we launched Micro to Millions. We got that where it went and, and it just grew from there. So I didn't really take on a lot you're of people. Well known for your Micro to Millions. Say that again? You're well known for that is the product you're well known for. I would say... This program still probably, running. Is... Yeah, still running now. I would say... Abund- financial abundance is what I'm known for mm-hmm. because it's a program called financial. Abundance. No, no, no. Just that the idea of financial oh. abundance is what I'm known for. Um, money DNA. I'm pretty known for a little bit as well. Cause mm-hmm. we talk a lot about that on the, on the podcast and stuff, mm-hmm. but you do podcasts. I do. Yeah. How often? Uh, I'm just stopping for the summer now, but mm-hmm. generally, you know, I guessed as much as I can. I've been on, on a three, 400 podcasts as a guest. And then I will record a couple of days a week. We do some recording, yeah. Amazing, so yeah. quite prolific. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been doing that since 2018. You record just educating or you, you, you interview people? Mixed, mixed. Not as much of the interviews. So I, I did all pretty much solo and a couple of interviews at yeah. first. And then the strategy, that one of the strategies I used to grow the podcast was only interviewing people for a year and a half. So we've got one of my podcasts is top 0.5% globally. The other one's top 1%, although that might have gone up a bit because we've, we've seen an increase in downloads. But it was having interviews was one of the things that we did and great interviews and then empowering people to share. And then the show. So when you was doing to the camera or on the solo, yeah. how long does it last? Solo, I tended to keep them sub 15 minutes. Not live, just record, edit, send out. Yeah. Spotify, iTunes. All of the things. Yeah. We used Anchor as what I've always used Anchor. Really easy platform. I've used Anchor since the early days. We still use it now because it, it posts it everywhere for you. You keep saying we, who's we? Me and the team. Who's your team? Oh God, team now. All over the world? All over the world, outsource. yeah. Yeah, outsourced all over the world. Everyone's independent contractor, um, but a lot of them, they get enough work from me that they don't really need to work with anyone else. Amazing. Yeah. So you're still growing? So back end of last year, we had a really successful year last year, but I, I kind of felt that it had gotten too businessy and away from the original intention of what I was doing. And so... The first part of this year, I was really sort of separating the church and state of the serving piece and the business piece. And so we've identified what we want to do on the businessy side. So we, we've we got the model for how we're going to be marketing. Thinking the program. we, who's your peer group? I talk, I talk are about you, are like you him. just being very kind by saying we waste your, your business, your yeah. decision, your thoughts, your yeah, but that's it. But it wouldn't happen without my team. I know, but yeah. you're <laughs> you, right? yeah, you yeah. need them to make it happen, but yeah. you don't sit there on the boardroom table, they don't make decisions. You make the decision, I do, you drive it, yeah, I do. You're just being kind by saying, yeah, I, 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 I really love my team. I, I know I wouldn't, I wouldn't be where I am the way I am. I probably could have still got there, but I wouldn't be where I am. I mean, I work three days a week not really more than 10 hours and I get to not really do anything I don't really want to do. And that's because I've got a team that kind of. But you're care. single right now. Yes. Single right now. Um, Did you have to help being single doing all these things around the world or mm, you were free? There's somebody married that may not have the chance to try. I mean, it depends on the way the relationship set up. Mm-hmm. I think some people have, a partner or a partnership romantically that's conducive in how it's set up. I know people that do to, that do do it that way. But for me and my character, 
I would say it's it's probably better that I do it this way. Yeah. Future. I've thought about it. You have beautiful Ethan. Yeah, that's all you need, right? Yeah, I get on really, really well with Olga, his mum. Like really, really well. We're like best mates. Um, she's gonna come here. And yeah, work, or she's got other things. She's no, no, no. I, I look after her. She doesn't. She doesn't need to work. She can just focus on 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 on, on being a mum. Um, and so, someone would really have to come in and be really, really special for me to enhance your life. Yeah, like it would have to be an undeniable, explosive, supernatural. Otherwise, my life really, really works. You know, you're happy. And I'm not missing a relationship. But then for me, I, for me, love is love. And this is, I think, somewhere people get, get lost. Intimacy, sex, you can get. You can order it to your house. It's, you know, if we're crude about it, you can order it to your house. But having real meaningful connections doesn't necessarily really require a romantic relationship with people. And so I've cultivated loving, nurturing relationships, including with women, that fill me up with the love that I need without me needing to complicate it necessarily by bringing Are they aware of that? Do you have you left a trail of her? Oh, no, 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 no. No, I'm very... You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I know. They don't get the boundaries. They don't understand. Yeah, but, I, but, but this, is one of the really why, this is why communication is really, really important. Mm -hmm right and outlining exactly what what's going on and everybody being clear and also your behavior if you're going to leave people that say they don't leave people on you know you let people on right you, you know it's in the game you, yeah. you know and so i think it takes a self-awareness to know how to be amongst people and not leave them on right not you make be, a conscious decision very very conscious everybody knows where they stand and exactly leave. what about your peer group we met through a friend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's not as successful as you. No, but um, he's one of the most lovely, genuine he's humans that I know. Beings. Yeah, he is. And because, I mean, he, one of the things I love about him is that he he, he regularly would say, why are you friends with me? Like, like, I don't bring anything. It's like, but you do bring. You bring by being you. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to have a peer group that's balanced so i spend a lot of my time with people who are more successful than me i love being the dumbest brokest least accomplished person in the room and then i dedicate through my work bringing people up and then i've also got space just to be me and not need to be going up or down and i think that anchoring space in the middle is one of the most important spaces and i think it's one of the ones that we do sight of so all your days planned you know exactly what doesn't pretty much a coincidence pretty much how I'm, I'm quite sure. Have you spend your week? Have you spend your day? What time do you wake up? What time do you go to bed? How often do you exercise? All right. So I like to, so I go for my walk every day. I like to get at least seven to 10,000 steps in every day. At the moment, I go for a nice walk around the arena, go down morning, to Gabia. I like to do it at night okay. at the moment, especially because it's bloody hot. <laughs> so I go do, do walk about nine. Uh, I prefer to get the workout done early in the morning. At the moment, I've got things, a few things I'm doing with, with the East Coast of the US. I've been up a bit later, so I've been training later in the day. But I like to get a good three, four minimum weights sessions in. Um, you push yourself. I like to push myself. Yeah. So I do. You like don't have a personal trainer, right? You push it. You and uh, the chef push yourself. My personality doesn't really get on with personal trainers all the time. Okay. I'm I'm better having a training partner where we push each other because you know what you need. I will get like the odd session here and there with a personal trainer to like mix it up and learn some new exercises or whatever, but. I I know that I get I get better out of me and I'm more consistent with the gym mm -hmm. when I, for example, train out with our, our mutual friend than if I had a personal trainer. Do you train with other mutual friends or just no? Interesting. Here, here, him. Interesting. Yeah. And uh, how long have you been in Dubai now? I've been coming here for twenty years. But you're still not fully living here. You're still now. I am pretty much living here since last September October. But I've been going back to Mexico to go and spend time with my son for you. Mexico. I've got residency here. I've got residency in Mexico. I've got you have a home there? You have a home here? Well, they've got a home there. I just stay in a hotel when I'm there, just across the road. Yeah, Olga and... Uh, yeah. Oh, that's yeah, yeah. Good. I think it's important to have the clean line so I don't stay in the house. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, no, I just wanted to be, she was on holiday and then you met there, but she actually resides there. No, she was living in New York. 
So the, the story's funny. She was living in New York. I was living in Mexico. We met at a meditation sheet in Mexico. We were just friends. I would hang out with her friends, like meditating yeah. stuff together when I'm in New York. We ended up falling into it. Then she came to Mexico to visit me at the beginning of COVID and got stuck. And we have a COVID baby. So that's what ended up happening. So it wasn't intentional for who to be. I have a COVID baby. Yeah. Gorgeous. Yeah. And she stayed. Yeah. She stayed. She stayed. It's the best place for Ethan. I mean, first and foremost, there was obviously still the COVID situation and lockdowns. Yeah. Um, and then um, I don't want to live in the US. And it's a really quite safe, lovely yeah, place lovely. where we are. Um, and so she stayed, but now she does want to move. And so, you know, we've agreed that he's. Did you have to sell Dubai to her? No, she's come, come over. She's come here before and she liked she it. Liked it. Yeah. And this has got the middle ground of everything we need. Great place to raise a child, safe. Education's great. Infrastructure, infrastructure like all of the things. Room. It's close to her family in Russia. Mine is still in, you know, England and Europe. Um, it's got the cosmopolitan, but also got the slow pace as well. So it's got a mix for everything. So it's in terms of everybody's needs this covers everybody's needs beautiful so uh, he's got a good nursery right when he comes yeah he goes so he goes to a, a really good preschool at the moment a private preschool where they teach them social skills um they teach them numbers um they teach them like counting they bring like animals in and teach them about animals so it's learning through play so they're actively learning sure at like, that age at that age yeah Amazing. he's been going there since he was one and a half are you still learning i always i read at you least read? Oh. yeah i read at least 45 books a year yeah i i do three to four books a month uh podcast every day a youtube video that's going to expand my video my mind every day don't watch tv not really i've got some shows i'll watch now and then but it's like there's dedicated time for that i've downtime for that and if i need like just to chill for a little bit yes i will but you won't just find me in front of the idiot box when there's other things to do i'm not a big drinker just social social but like there's always a good wine in the house. I've got a particular winery in Italy. I like, I found a shop here that has that winery. So I'm very happy about that. Do you socialize at night? Do you yeah, go out not, yeah, late yeah, nights or no? Yeah, not every night. I mean, I like to go for, I mean, so many beautiful places to have meals here, you know, go with friends and have a meal. Um, there's a couple of places I do enjoy going to here to have a little foot tap. Um, I won't do it every weekend, but um, I do make sure that I do let my hair down and go and have some fun um, at least a couple of times a month. Do you feel you have enough fun? Because you seem to be very uh, focused and, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, everything designed and sick. But, but I enjoy the things I do. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Like, are you enjoying? Because when I meet smart people, mm -hmm. they have a lot of battles going on internally. Yeah. Are you with me? You mm -hmm. think quite relaxed about the whole thing. Just Yeah, because I keep, I keep balanced. Mm -hmm. I do my best to keep balanced. And that, for me, is recognizing that as humans, we are not one-dimensional, right? And so... I enjoy the martial arts I do. I enjoy the instruments I play. I enjoy... What do you play? I play the guitar and the piano. Like, no, fluently. Yeah, like, just messing around. I, I, I make music is one of the things that I'm quite creative. I wow. make music with it. Um, so... Anything you don't do? Yeah, there's lots of stuff that I don't do. But I, I tend you, to... Do you, have you done, like, jumping off planes and stuff? Like I've, done, I've done that, yeah. Would you do it again? I think God spared me. So, <laughs> like, I don't want to push no, my nuts. Okay, yeah. I, it was a great experience... I really did enjoy it. I did it in Las Vegas um, about eight years ago, whatever. I've thought about doing it here and some friends are coming to visit later this year. I bother. But they've got, the, it's a great view here over the palm and stuff. Some friends are coming and you they want to do it. So I'll probably do it with them over the palm. Yeah. So you have no fears? I have fears. What are your fears? I've got lots of fears. But I recognize, I mean, the, the fact- You never that, worry though. I, I do worry, but it doesn't last very long. Worry about money? sometimes yes i mean being a business owner you've got to make the cash flow you've got to make the bills da, 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 da. like you can stretch yourself too much but worry doesn't generally last too long for me because i've got a practice called check-ins so at several points in the day an alarm will go off on my you phone that says pause what's going on what are you thinking about how are you feeling right now what have you done since the last time you checked in every, I, well, sorry, day. Every, every day multiple times over the course of the day so i will struggle to go unconscious for more than a few hours Crazy. Um, sometimes I'll do that check-in. It's like, yeah, I want to be in my feelings for a little bit. Okay, be in your feelings, but the long it's a decision. It's, it's a decision. It's not, I'm just in my feelings. You know, sometimes I get up and it's like, 
it's like even like with the depression people think that the depression went away it didn't it's just i've resourced myself to be able to deal with it mm -hmm. there are mornings when i get up and i can recognize in my physiology that something's going on mm -hmm. okay i'm going to take it easy this morning wow i'm going to go for a walk right i speak i live a pretty intense life mm -hmm. inside and outside mm -hmm. i'm intense mm -hmm. i don't know if that's good or not people can't do you know what it is i noticed that people can't stay with the pace the right people will be able to stick with the pace mm -hmm. I just don't put myself out there because I've been hurt so many times. So I'm just an introvert. No friends, no acquaintances, nothing. Just happy in my own little cave. But, but this is the thing. It's, it's whether... And, and I'm if happy. I'm actually... That's a, but happy. that's the thing I was going to say. To be happy. happy. I'll go for... Apart from like the gym, I'll go for a couple of days without really seeing anyone. Right? And I'm... Because you're constantly developing. And... Well, I'm good with that. I, the thing is, I think it's important to understand there are some people that would be better off not being around people but because they don't feel confident enough in their own skin they're always around people yes true they're filling holes they're right? filling holes and so i think it's really about understanding what you need and giving yourself that understanding this is what i need i will give myself that i don't need that why am i doing it it's like with alcohol right i can have a glass of champagne i can have like a nice cocktail or two if I go to have a third one, it's going to be the choice. I'm enjoying this time. I'm enjoying this drink. I'm going to have another one. Mm -hmm. I've never been, or actually there was one time, but that's another story. <laughs> one time in Italy that we won't talk about. Yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's another podcast. But I don't have like, I've never been blackout drunk ever. I've never not for, remember what I've done or work up in a strange place or whatever. Mm -hmm. I've always intentionally stopped. My body actually says, mm, we've had enough. Okay, pause. I'll have a pint with my brother watching the football or whatever. I'm good with one. Maybe I'll have a second one, but I probably won't finish the second one. Does your brother come here? Um, he hasn't on this protracted trip that I've been doing. Okay. But um, but uh, my nephew's going to be moving out here because we've been running one of our businesses out of here. We're, we're trading him up to take it over. That's why I was adoring the office because we're not going to have anything this big, but I like the vibe and the design. So here then, my brother will be coming out here more regularly. Beautiful. Yeah. You've got to have an office here. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Establish an office. Yeah. So you're going to stay? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm running away to Italy for the summer, though. For the... Where are you? I'm going to Naples this weekend. This weekend? This weekend. I'm going to be in Naples. My brother and my brother in law's Neapolitan. Second week of July. Okay. How long are you staying? A week or two? So I'm. So my plan, as is, is I'm going to go and do um, some downtime in Como, the first few days of July. Then by yourself? Well, by myself. I'm going to go by myself. Then I'm going to go down to Florence, which is where I go normally. I'm based out of Florence yeah. normally. Yeah. I was actually going to get a place there last year and spend half the year there, but um, it, it didn't really feel aligned, so I'm not doing it. And also, when I went to do it, everything kind of resisted, but that's another story. So I'll do Florence, and then I'm going to go down to um, to Naples and meet up with my siblings for my brother-in-law's birthday celebration. And then my mate and his wife are having their 10-year wedding anniversary at their place in Ibiza, and I'm going to go and do that. It's a busy, busy sun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. July, I'm pretty much, from the 1st till the end of July, is all scheduled. June isn't. But I might, I might head out to Italy earlier in June. We'll see. I need to get my nephew settled in first. Once that's done, then I'll. I have an emotional attachment to to Italy. I just love Italy. Yeah, Romans and gladiators. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, amazing. We're going to Mykonos, Alaska, or nice. and then, uh, six weeks in the states. Nice. Mykonos. I went last year. It was the first time. I loved it in Mykonos. Yeah, it's beautiful. I'm going to go in September. The, that town, the little town. I don't know what. Do it you is. know why the streets are built like that? Do you know? Because of the wind. No, because they didn't want pirates. Oh, the pirates. Yeah. Yes, yes, it's yes. Amazing, isn't it? They made the the got lost. Yeah, you get, yeah, lost, you get all lost all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow, I've seen this shop three times. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, but the, but it protects from the wind as well because when you're in there because it was super windy. In the clever, the wind is very clever. Beautiful. Place. I loved it. And the funny thing is, I've heard about Mykonos all of these times, and I went. Um, second week of september last year so it was it right beautiful, right? At, right at the end of the season yeah the heat's died off yeah not drunk people summoning everywhere but still a still a good party yeah. or whatever uh met some amazing Where places stay? um i had a villa just outside so you got your own villa. Yeah, got a villa. Yeah. there were a few of us that, that went right so i'm i'm, I'm I, i'd like to do about two weeks in mm -hmm. september mm -hmm. so you get a villa again get you a have a flash lifestyle fancy cars and Okay. You don't feel that's necessary for your social media people to know, or your followers to know that you're successful. I so get, they... I get people, especially people that have supported me with in the business, complaining that I don't show off enough. I've got a few nice watches and stuff. 
I do drive a nice car here. What car do you have? I've got a 911 here. Nice. But I don't, you won't. You always flash it. No. no. I'm, I'm... The only time it's been on my social media is when I went to pick up my mate and he put it, okay. he put it on there. Which um, one is it? I've uh, got a Carrera. Okay, which yeah. one? Which one? It's a 911. 911 Carrera, silver uh, with red seats. 4S, S, GTS. No, just Carrera S. Nice. Standard. I love Porsche. I don't. I'm not a car person. Like, I, I couldn't tell you, like, oh, all the brake pass. I just enjoy driving that car, and I've got enough speeding fines with this one. I don't use Do three. I don't, I don't speed a lot, but I've had enough. I'm the safest I've had... driver. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I don't do less more than 90 kilometers. You don't, don't do more than 90? I'm like this. I'm boring. Do you know what it is? Mm -hmm. How do you know? I've, I've, yeah, I've uh, at the gym. <laughs> oh, you've seen it. I've seen it at the gym. Yeah. I, have, I have the uh, Taycan Turbo S. That's faster than the Ferrari. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I've had them all. And mm -hmm. uh, but do you know what it is? That mm -hmm. kind of, I sitting in the driveway, mm -hmm. that's the only thing that I feel tells me that I've made. Really? Crazy, isn't it? I look at it, I go, yes. Mm -hmm. My little bit. I don't drive it. I don't like the track. Mm -hmm. I get invited to Ferrari, Porsche, everything. Mm -hmm. I think it's the worst thing they could do to me because I feel sick three days afterwards. Really? Yeah, your helmet. <laughs> like, yeah, I guess seasick. But, but, but again, I think this is why it's important. Like, just feel good. So, for example, my mate came out in November. We went to go yes. to watch the Grand Prix, and he's a Lambo man, and um, he was trying to convince me that I should move over to to Lamborghini. Yes. So we got some for the weekend. Yes. Um, Porsche is the most complete car you can buy. I just, I'm like, I'm really happy. I'm happy in this. Yes. The the trouble is. Is that when I don't know why we're in a position of people look up to us? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, you have to show a little you bit. You have to show because otherwise they think you're a cop. You're this, and then the haters will think you've rented it anyway, right? They're gonna hate anyway. But, the, so. but I mean, the, this is the thing. So I could be more aggressive with my social media. Which, oh, look at me! I'm flying first class. Or mm -hmm. I'm really committed to serving the people that aren't sold on that they're sold on the work they're sold on on what it means and the transformation it's going to give so right now are you advertising your your courses one of them we are so there's one there's one program that we did quite well with last year that's got some great results and so you're constantly developing programs and courses. not anymore okay. i'm i've been sort of drilling down and refining so all of that i mean i've been making programs for years so i bought abundanceuniversity.com i bought that domain and we've done a membership for that and we're May throwing a take note. Yeah. i'd love to see this yeah so we're building that out now. Uh, I actually need to speak to you about that because what we do is we, we want to invest, invite guest people to come and drop one of their entry pro level programs sure. on the platform as well. So just, just make it. Uh, got a four hour, 21 module program on Udemy. And that's so it. Launched it now, yeah. Nice. You excited about it? <laughs> Not particularly. <laughs> what I am excited about is we developed an interactive training ah. program whereby um, I felt that pe people can watch your videos for free mm -hmm. hours and hours of it mine too right mm -hmm. something if, why would someone want to pay a thousand dollars for watch other eight hours of me right mm -hmm. or four hours of me so but to have the engagement correct so mm -hmm. what i've done is i've developed this interactive program through bradley's uh program lightspeed pt oh yeah yeah i know what you're talking about mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so basically it's live and i put all my uh, glad to mastery training from telesales field sales negotiations closing techniques everything but it, it engages Got the you. videos depends on the answer the video goes a different direction i've heard about that model before yeah so that's what i'm developing nice now if you imagine if you're a company and you got uh, corporates i'm not interested with you individuals mm -hmm. you're a corporate company you've got 50 salespeople. Mm -hmm. you have to shut the company down to train them mm -hmm. If you're doing working hours, half the people don't want to be trained. Mm -hmm. You got to pay the sales trainer to go, and you got to pay a fortune then. Mm -hmm. Half that people within six months leave anyway. So you got to get the person to come and train the new person. Mm -hmm. You're stopping productivity. You can't monitor out of that hundred who's it paying attention or not. Out mm -hmm. of that fifty paying attention or not. Mm -hmm. They're on the phones and stuff like that. So I felt with this program, you don't have to pay. You pay thirty dollars per month per seat. Awesome. It's interactive. At any time at all, they can monitor who's engaging. Because who's they're having to give answers. The moment they give the answers, whether it's a recording, a graph, a chart, a anything, mm -hmm. the manager gets the report. <laughs> and they don't have to shut the company down and they can see who's committed or not. And if that person leaves, it's repeatable training. 
Same so you can watch it a hundred times and play. So instead of them having to invest in a full external trainer to come in, you've got a digital one that's much more cost effective for them and actually allows them to track because they can actually use this as part of the performance review. Exactly. You know, you were doing the it's, training. Yeah. You can check what their you, results are. You didn't are. log on for three months. You're not interested. Yeah. You're telling me you're suffering in yeah. your because you're not in training. Yeah. You're not engaged. And it could be recording. Do me a 30 second. Based on what we said now, press the record button and do me a 30 second elevator pitch. <laughs> and then that record is sent to the manager. Amazing. Yeah. We, we spent a fortune on that. We're launching it uh, three weeks, three weeks down the line. Oh, nice. Yeah. Keep me posted on that one. I'd love to see. Um, how we, are we can do something together or something promote it. Yeah. Uh, we add, and also for $30 per month per seat, we keep adding things. So now we're working on um, client service, mm -hmm. how to keep the client, mm -hmm. customer management. Yes. Are you going to be going to tier one companies with this one or SMEs? Literally real estate at the beginning. Real estate. Smart. Because it's the biggest in this market. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Once we establish that, mm -hmm. we're going to go online and sell it to anybody who's got salespeople, tell us. But you've got a good pillar place to start and plant your seed, get your, get your um, case studies, testimonials, yeah, all of the stuff. Yeah. Oh, God. 10,000 testimonials because of my courses, right? Now I'm talking about on this particular platform. Yeah, if, yeah. You know, but with the test, you can twist it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like yeah, yeah. My training shit works, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's just such a no brainer. Because mm -hmm. if I was an owner of a company, it makes sense. Yeah, Why do I need to hire a trainer? Why do I need to pay an external person? Why do I need to shut the company down? And there's times when I'm paying this guy $10,000 and I look at half the room and half asleep. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? This way I can monitor every Everything. single person and not shut the company down. Mm. And it's a training by somebody like you or me who are expensive, right? Mm -hmm, so. mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's really smart. That's what do they call it? That's a, um, a no brainer offer. I think so. Yeah, I think so. One of my challenges is to get my young salespeople mm -hmm. to get it. Mm -hmm. Again, it's youth. They don't value training. So I've got to, I'm, I'm training for at least six weeks before I get them out of the marketplace selling. Got it. Got Make it. sure they get the head around what a no brainer mm -hmm. deal this is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I always find it's like we said, showing them the pain and giving them the pill, right? Absolutely. Yeah. When I came here, nobody knew what I did. So my pitch was, uh, it was uh, I sell aspirin. So what do you mean? I said, I find your business headache and I fix it. When can I come and see, <laughs> see, see if you have a headache? Maybe I can't. Let's go and see if you have a headache. <laughs> so that's and they were like intrigued. They're like, oh, okay, come and see me. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a really, really good one. Actually. We, we, we got to talk. I, 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 there's a lot of, I'm not, 10% as smart as you are. I really am not. And I'm not just saying this just to kiss ass. I've learned everything through being a dummy in the room because I'm the hardest worker. And I think people that might see, like when I meet people that are really, really smart or really, really accomplished, I think the more that we look for what we can pull from that person versus or what we can learn from them in their experience versus, oh, like the comparanoia thing, right? Because at no point have I ever heard you refer to any of the areas that you've had to work on as something that's held you back. You said, no, it's just something for me to, it's just something to leverage. Like, Absolutely. I'm going to build on that. I'm going to grow from that. And I think that is one of the key things that separates people who win at life and people that don't. I think so. I also think that um, I always ask the question, how can I? I never, I'm ne jealousy has never been in an ounce of me mm -hmm. you know i never look at people with envy i always look at i can do that they're mm -hmm. just like me mm -hmm. but i just don't know yet i like to celebrate people that win i mean my my view on they inspire that the interconnectedness of energy and how we all work is that the more that i look at someone and celebrate them the more that i can have the positive impact of that in my life too Beautiful. if i see someone who's got something that i'm working towards or working on mm -hmm. i celebrate that that thing's becoming closer to me because i can see it physically that means it's coming in closer proximity and so i pour more celebration and lifting up people who are doing well how can i help you is there any way i can help you in anything what i know you can help me <laughs> <laughs> well i think this conversation has been really nourishing and inspiring number one number two um I'd love to spend more time with you because I think you're a good person, a, a, a successful person. And I do want to spend more time with solid, successful people, not even necessarily from just energy wise. Yeah. 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 You're going to have to do business yeah, together. Yeah. Exactly. I would go and smoke a cigar sometime or whatever. Right. Um, because I'm, I think that the time that you spend in open energy with people is really going to indicate where you're at. Because they say, oh, the people you spend the most time with, but it's not just the people you spend time with, it's the people you spend time with unconsciously. Correct. 
So having spaces that you can go into where you can just be in a, just a chill down vibe. People have had more experience as well. You've got 20 years on me in life, That's probably more business. Be, oh, come yeah. on. You've got a lot more than that over me, but that would definitely be isn't everything. <laughs> <laughs> That's what she said. <laughs> But definitely that, yeah. definitely that, definitely that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I'd love to know about your funnel. I'd love to know about ClickFunnel because it's something that we're talking to them about. Mm -hmm. But I don't even, because I'm not technically minded, mm -hmm. I'm not interested. I've got I've got the man. The man who does mine is a guy called Joel Irway. He's a friend of mine. Yes, please. Um, You can look him up. Joel Elway. E-R-L-W-A. E-R-L-W-A-Y. I think that's how you spell his name. But um, Joel. Yeah, J O E L. He's the daddy. He does the the one that we've that we've just decided we're going to go with. It together. You call him in. He'll create the offer, validate. Is he based here? No, he's in he's in the states. They will validate the offer, create the offer, amazing. Create the landing pages amazing. and run the ads for you. I have so much content. Yeah, I'll, I'll put you in touch. Thank you so much. Yeah. Really appreciate. He's, it. he's my. He's sitting on it, you know, with the nah, he, belt, right? He's the guy. He's the uh, guy. I don't want to do something and do it half nah, He's the guy. He's the guy. Thank you for that. Yeah. And then uh, I'll show you our program about the yeah, interactive and we'll yeah. do something together. 100%. Do you do seminars anymore? I did the last one for a while in Mexico in April of this year. I used to do a three day one called Alchemy of Abundance, which was it's a really powerful program. It's it's a it's not an, an enrollment event. It's a pure. How many people? How anything from twenty, anything from twenty to forty people. We charged about nine nine seven. Okay. Um, it's not an enrollment event. It's a purely delivery event. Yeah. We get a room. We get a room block at a nice hotel, the same hotel we've been using in Mexico, mm -hmm. two three times a year. I'm consolidating and stuff right now. Obviously, I want to get my nephew settled in here. I've got my son settled in. So I didn't want to plan anything more you this year. Focus. Yeah. Focus. Um, and then I'm going to see what we're going to do next year in terms of seminar stuff. Mm -hmm. I do love doing seminars. So if I could work with, for example, um, an event organizer. Event that I would. I'm the same. Yeah, I, I would. Do I would do I'm it. Not an event organizer. Yeah, yeah, I would. I, I would. I would do. If I, if there was someone like, hey, I could put bums in seats for you, I'd do it all day long. Exactly. Me too. But it's the energy that I mean, people that talk about events and stuff, they don't realize how much energy has to go into so putting good. together, marketing it, organizing it. All that at mm. the same time, if you're the professor, you don't want to be on the phone selling the ticket. And mm. That's what I. That's what I found demeaning. And it ends up it ends up being what you sometimes have to do, which is why the, the way that we structured this one was different to how I've done it before. What I was doing before is because it doesn't matter if ten people, twenty people, fifty people, or hundred people show up. I just need to call the hotel and see how many seats I need. Yeah. So it's a lot easier for me to to do. So we did it that way, and then we tended to get a lot of people coming back. And yeah, then so going there. Big that, but yeah. What about how many followers do you have? I mean, in your tribe, not mm -hmm. followers on social media. How, yeah. many, how many people do you have in your tribe? I don't know. Because we've got them across a couple of Facebook groups and we've got an app. A few thousand core ones, I would Amazing. say. Yeah. Do you have a retainer program that people pay you? Now that we've set up Abundance University, that's what that's going to be. Okay. And so we're going to be rolling that out more quote unquote aggressively over how this year. Uh, 97 a month for access to the content. And then we've got a level two access where my coaches will do group coaching. Mm -hmm. We want to get that up to a couple of times a week, but it's one time a week now. You have to, are you coaching the coaches? I coach them, yes. Because they sound like they deliver what you do. They deliver what I, my frameworks in their own way. And that's what makes them unique. Mm -hmm. So for example, Nathan comes very much from the power of the subconscious mind. And so he's amazing. He's a, a G when it comes to like the unconscious mind and frameworks mm -hmm. with that, but also very, very deep into the metaphysical side of things as well, but very grounded. Mm -hmm. And he's very, very solid. So the way he delivers is different, but if my frame works. And Leah is more nurturing. And these two people have already their own businesses. They've got their own businesses. Okay. And then I contract them to deliver for me. Mm -hmm. And then when I've got one-on-one -on -one clients, I pay them to do the delivery and give them the clients for the one-on-one -on -one work. What kind of clients are you looking for? One-on-one? -on -one? Oh, not that you're looking, but uh, who would you work with? I would say that for where I'm at right now, the only person I'm really interested in is someone that has business or business aspirations. The reason being is right now the world is very confused and a lot of people think that they want to be a business person or they think, and I'm not here to help you decide what you want to do. I'm here to show you how to get from point A to point, point B. And so the only one-on-one -on -one coaching I do is VIP day. So I do VIP day, VIP weekend. 
And for that, someone has to really have a very clear objective. Your every day is a whole day with someone. A high, whole day with me. Not every month. No, 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 no. One, or... one day. How much do you charge? Fifteen. Fifteen thousand dollars. Yeah, and twenty-five for the two days. So, and that's in person or virtual. But that you know, people apply for it and don't get it because you qualify. I have to qualify them because I'm not interested in someone that wants to pay 15,000 to someone to have another excuse for why it didn't work mm -hmm. out or it's not going to show up so because I'm not going to be holding your hand afterwards. We're going to sit down. We're going to put it together and just implement. Then you need to go and implement. You've got to have the desire. You have the need. And you if you're not, then I, I, I can't help you. I can't help you. Mm -hmm. And for me, not every dollar is a good dollar. Not every dirham is a good dirham. Yeah. Right. And I've learned that the hard ways I'm sure a lot of people have that you, you bring a client on because it's money and then I don't sell my soul for money anymore. <laughs> yeah, years ago, yeah, it costs it costs you more, right? Mm. Um, so yeah, that's what I do. So that that's the way we structured that one. But the the membership program, I wanted to make it accessible. I wanted to have the freedom to create programs if I'm in the mood to create a program or I get an idea without having to flog it yes. separately. Yes, yes. Just chuck it in the membership and just say, hey, there's a new program. It's like me. Prime. Yeah. yeah, we're calling it the Netflix of abundance. Yeah, amazing. yeah, yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. Uh, one more question. No, two more questions. Mm -hmm. Andrew Tate. Where do I stand on him? I got a little bit obsessed with him back end of last year because I found him fascinating. Mm -hmm. I was initially fascinated. Um, I like to learn from what people have done because he went from obscurity to being everywhere. Yes, yeah. So I wanted to see the model that he went through and see if I could learn anything from it, which I you know, picked up a few things. He's a divisive character, deliberate. He's polarizing deliberately. But he said something once that I was like, it's kind of true. He says, you say that men are strong. I say that women are weak. We're saying the same thing, but I'm saying it in a way that you don't agree right. with. Yeah. And when you look at the core tenets of what he's trying to teach men, I think it's needed to a degree. I don't necessarily agree the with way the way he does it, but that's not for me. But I, that doesn't resonate with me. But there are people who need it. But then somebody like you and I would get the message within the tonality. Yeah. But I think because I'm a, a more of a critical thinker, when he was getting deplatformed and people saying he's misogynist and blah, 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 it's like, well, if you listen to what he's saying, he's not a misogynist. I don't get into the conspiracy theory side of it, but I was like, is there something I can learn from here? I think that there are things that can be learned from a lot of people. Some people perhaps for whom what they are i mean it's probably less than you, you could learn from the darkest characters in history but I you wouldn't want to extremely smart as well i mean if you look at the way he plays chess and yeah unbelievable and man. the way that he plays life definitely very right well. mm -hmm. goes to the gym mm -hmm. body his so if you look at the way that he did that like even um he saw fighting as a way to move get ahead yeah. then he took that and then he went and he had the webcam business that he did yes, yes. and then he's leveraged that and now they've got more than two hundred thousand people paying them 49 dollars a month they're making 10 million a month on their membership program mm -hmm. 10 it's probably grown since i've been in jail 10 Smart. million you you deplatformed him and he's still increasingly mm -hmm. making more than Have 10 you signed to his program no it's not for me do you know him? we don't know do we what's in well, I've, I've looked around and I've, I've kind of, but the, the, the energy isn't, doesn't match my energy. So I get. Although you could maybe pick a few things. There could be things to pick, but the, the key thing is the community, but the community is more. And this is the thing, unfortunately, and I don't mean this to be disrespectful. So I hope nobody's offended by this. One of my favorite films is a film called The Count of Monte Cristo. There was the original one with Richard Chamberlain and, yeah, there was the, I know, yeah. and there's the remake with Jim Casviel and Guy Pearce. And when I remember the first, you remember the first one, yeah. So when, which is true to the text, because the book is dark, it's not a happy book. <laughs> it's a really dark book. Ali Dubax was was really, but there's a there's a scene in the remake where Edmund Dantes meets Napoleon, and Napoleon says, "In life, we're either kings or pawns." And then when Edward Dantes goes, Napoleon having manipulated him. Napoleon says to his assistant, kings and pawns, emperors and fools. Wow. And so there are a lot of people who don't recognize that they are pawns. And as a result, they never promote to be something else. And they end up being the fool to an emperor. Hey, well, he's in the happy being pawns, right? That's and that's okay, yeah. right? Because we need them in this world. We, we, but the thing is, is that there are some people who are blindly following. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it because maybe it's improving their life. And he actually said this once. He did a video once. It was really fascinating. He says, there's always someone manipulating you. At least I'm manipulating you to, to be better. 
and I want the best for you. So let me manipulate you. Mm -hmm. And so there's, there's, there's an energy there that doesn't really resonate with me from that perspective in terms of the blind following. And so the community isn't where I feel, I don't feel my energy elevated by that community. I would rather take the lessons as I can. It, at your at your choosing. Yeah, yeah, I would love to meet him. I'd love to have a conversation. Never met I, him. I, no, I'd love to. I, I think he's probably going to come here next. So when he's done, of course, in Romania. So we'll probably get a chance to meet him. But um, yeah, fascinating person. Very very smart. Again, yeah, extremely smart. Very very smart. Yeah, yeah. I admire him. People are listening to this. Mm -hmm. They might be in a dark, in the winter of their lives, or mm -hmm. the dark parts of their lives, mm -hmm. and. Uh, What's stopping from most two or three things or one? Mm -hmm. What's stopping from people from having abundance in their lives? You know, they. If they were listening to this, mm -hmm. we could give our two bits of nuggets. Mm -hmm. What what would you tell them? First and foremost, we have to learn to separate reality from truth, and I know that's a very difficult thing to grasp. How we started this yeah. podcast, right? bringing it back to the beginning. And I think one of the things with people that are into stuff like manifestation, positive thinking, all that stuff, they tell you to pretend that your reality is true, but we have to own where we are to move through where we want to be. That's reality. That's reality. And so anyone who's not where they want to be, the first thing you have to do is accept that you're not where you want to be mm -hmm. and get the full lay of the land of where you are and then get a very, very razor clear vision of at least where you want to go next. It doesn't have to be the whole way through, but what's the next step for you? I if you're in debt, pain, it's pain and pleasure. Move away from the pain of where you are now. Go towards the. But pleasure. you have to know the details exactly. of that, and it doesn't mean that you have to go from being in debt to being a billionaire. The next step might just be that I can handle paying my debts and servicing my debts. Oh, 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 you gotta go west again. <laughs> I'm really intrigued this conversation. I mean, I'm loving this by the way. Me too. Um, a lot of nine out of ten. Let's say I'm a student. I pay this day. I'm studying with you, mm -hmm. and I kind of know. And one of those things, maybe my personal life, I'm compromising. Mm -hmm. And I'm, it may be holding me back, but just for the sake of peace, mm -hmm. I'm living it. Mm -hmm. I'm compromising. It's not disruptive, but I know it's not where I want to be. I'm not playing 10 out of 10 over there. Mm -hmm. Would you ask me to fuck it and burn it and move? Or would you say, I understand your position? My thing is this. Because it's, it's not, life isn't black and white. It's not. And one of my Danisms is push your edge and not your buttons. I think too often people go full out and then burn out or go into overwhelm and go into overload because they don't have the nervous system even that can deal with mm -hmm. burning it all down. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is, okay, if you're not playing full out, for example, and you know you're compromising in certain areas, what's the payoff for that compromising? So let's say, for example, um, let's say I'd stayed in my relationship mm -hmm. with my son's mum, right? I know that it's not the best place for either of us to be romantically. We get on better as friends than we do any other way. Yeah. Right. I had a choice of not seeing my son every day. Yes. Right. Or being a man that my son could look up to and respect and set a good example for him. And so in that moment, I asked myself the question, if my son came to me and described this in this situation, what would I tell him to do? And that's what gave me the leverage to make the challenging choice to not see him every day, but to also see the beauty of what that choice gives him in the longer run. May I challenge you if you don't? Sure. What if you thought, if I'm not seeing it every day, he mm. could witness things that I don't want him to witness because I'm not there. It's his journey, not mine. And this Although one, he's only two. It's his journey, not mine. But you could have a positive, more of a positive effect if you're around Pick yeah. him to school, pick him off of school daily. He copies you. Visually. But then I'm showing him to compromise. And that is a virus, a viral way of being that I didn't want him to have. I want him to see that you can make the high, high choice. He would have noticed that you were Of course he would have noticed. You would have been on that. Yeah. So now he's at the point where we can engage more. So we video call probably five out of seven days. We have our video calls. And he's like, the other day he was showing me the cartoon that he's Cute. watching and he was doing this dance that he wanted me to copy. And, you know, thankfully, I do have the resources to be able to get back on a regular basis and spend a lot of time with him and stuff. And, you know, at the end of the day, he's going to come here now and I will be able to take him to his after school activities. But it's more important for him to be in a loving, nurturing environment. Yes. Than for him to be in a less empowering, energetic you environment. Fear your partner finding somebody else and maybe he's on the right. I can't fear that. 
I can't fear that. And at the end of the day, I can't control what she does. Yeah. All I can do is ensure that I show up to and be, the best, you can be the best that I can be Beautiful. and support her so that she's happy because a happy mum is going to be a better situation. A happy my son. Wa uh, woman is better. better. Yeah. yeah. She's going to be miserable and resentful because I'm like, you can't see that person. What energy is my son living in? Hmm. Sorry, I diverted this no, second. No. So reality, yeah, where yeah. you want to go, yeah. So clarity of yeah. where you want to be, see the light, and then just take it one step at a time. Mm -hmm. Don't yeah. be too hard on yourself. Don't be too hard on yourself. Small, manageable steps. At the end of the thing, I think one of the things we do is we take life too seriously. None of us are getting out of this life. Mm -hmm. None of us are getting out of it alive. And when we realize the ephemeral finger snap nature of our life and that really the time that we spend worrying about what's going to happen next is pulling away from the experience of living life now, that starts to reframe and just take it a step at a time. Like I said, if you're in debt now, work first on being able to manage your debts, getting a hold on it so you can actually deal with that. Then maybe work on getting out of the debt, then work on to building a surplus. Start looking at, okay, can I start building some assets? Take it a step at a time. See, because every every level of the game is going to need different resources. It's going to need different learning, different skills, different mentorship, different coaching, different guidance, right? Someone who doesn't know what selling is, is going to need a different training to someone who's looking to change what they're selling and who they're selling to. Sure. So we have to understand those levels, but we can't do that if we're lying to ourselves and pretending that we're somewhere that we're not or not acknowledging the truth of where we are. Beautiful. Man, I salute you. I'm so glad with this dodgy eye, quasi here, <laughs> can cancel again. It's I'm glad we had the conversation. Thank today. you so much. Good. Let's do it again soon. 100%. Yeah, hundred percent. Let's. Uh, I have your WhatsApp number, right? Yeah, you WhatsApp. Got me. Let's do because we're gonna miss each other July, August. So let's do a drink before. Yeah, we'll do that because you're away. Are you a cigar time. man? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I've, I've got some, I've got some Cubans. I've got, let's do. I've it. got a Cubid with some Cubans. Can't wait. Look yeah, forward to we'll do that. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. And if people want to get hold of you, easiest way dreamwithdan.com. Dreamwithdan.com. And we put a text on there. Yeah, I, I write for Entrepreneur Magazine. You can find me on there as well. But the links to my blog, podcasts, socials, it's all on dreamwithdan.com. You got it. And then we'll put it in our. I'm going to send you the raw material. Oh, yeah, please. Uh, we're, we're falling behind a little bit because what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to get as much data, uh, content as possible before I decide. That's what So we're just falling in behind. But what no else is, I sent all the raw material yep. uh, on your approval with the edited, and then we'll go live. It sounds good to me. Thank you so much. Awesome. See you in the gym. Yeah, 100%. Much love. Thank <laughs> you. Salute you all. Take care, guys. Bye.